All right, I want to give you guys access to this pamphlet. It's going to explain uh, pretty nicely, I think. I read it. Um, you're backpropping the supports, the false work, the, the supports. Um, okay, so let's jump into it a little bit. It's going to some key points. Like it says, the case study looks at the experience of, of applying. Experiences of applying new criteria for the striking that remains, remains, remains removal of slabs in the design of backpropping. All right, so I guess let me go ahead and give you the rundown of it. <clears throat> Let's jump right down to the a chart if they have it. And so your spans are what matters, you know, with this backpropping also and your concrete mixture, what you're designed, what you're doing there. So I'm trying to think, uh, yeah, that's not very clear, is it? Hmm. Um, so the, the longer your spans are, the more, the longer you have to keep maintain your, your, uh, supports. So some of that floor might have only had like a three foot span on it, but it was integral with the next, next, next section of concrete next to it. So you would want to try to remove them all at the same time, even though you probably could remove that smaller span by, by, uh, uh two steel Piece of steel that might be 10 foot apart, for example. But you don't want to play that game. And I mean, what do you need that piece of steel that bad? Um, finding relationship to backpropping. I'm going to give you this link. Oh, cool. There's a chart. Um, so I have another chart on another one. Uh, new slab uh, being cast, load, total load. Uh, so this would be that one 100%. So one level backdropping. Backdrop. Back props, uh, two levels, 100%. Okay. False works, 100%, 100%, 100%. 100 Alright, let's step it up here. Um, slab two. Oh, no. No, slab one. So the next one you're going to, it's 100% you're going to have it supported. Say floor two down. So that floor is the first floor. Say that's 18. Then on 17, you can have about 70% uh, of uh, supports if you've gone out the required amount of days. And then, um, so in other words, you just can't start the next day pouring the next slab the next day without um, the slab below being able to take the loads. And you can see we come down, we down to slab three, 12%. I've seen this is 10% also. Uh, they're using 12. This is a UK, United Kingdom uh, pamphlet I was able to find. And it's kind of cool. Um, Conclusions. The distribution of loads for the supporting slabs at St. George Wharf was found to be close to the predicted by conventional approaches, assuming as an even distribution. Okay. Um, this must have been a, a, a study there. I didn't get that far in it. All right. That's a case study. I'm going to hand this to you, but I want to show you something else. Let me pause it and tie this in for you. And this is what I wanted to tie in for you about transfer slabs. I was trying to explain it to someone and I don't know how we got lost in translation on that but I was quite surprised that uh, that we did but here it is again in this format um, and the case of the 15th floor transfer slab well how close is that to what we're dealing with here right 16th floor but there is none transfer slab and this one would be down on 8th floor I, I don't think there's any transfer slab at all on the 16th floor they uh, might use uh, transfer beams Steel beams. All right. And the case of the 15th floor transfer slab, which was 600 millimeters thick with a soft weight of 14, okay. Three levels of back propping were employed. Three levels. So it means you go underneath one, two, and three. You're going down three levels while this is cured. Such a transfer, uh, transfer slab is often required if the column grid layout changes above the level in question. So this is the same thing they did in number eight. On the eighth floor, they changed... The, they changed, as I showed you, with the overlay of those uh, uh, the uh, sections. I showed you with the paper with the light behind it. As I showed you with that overlay, it shifts. The columns shift. And what they're saying, but we don't have a failure there, a reported failure there at this time. The person, uh, Margareta, on 7, though, is really disturbing to me. The further details I have, it, the further detail that was added to me by... 
um, Didi's uh, Didi asking the family members was that uh, they know him to be working on eight at the time that he was going to work. That's where he was going to be working or whatever they communicated, working on eight. But yet they had to recover his body on seven. That's what makes me wonder about how do you get on seven? How do you recover a body on seven if, the, if, the, if it only made it to the transfer slab, which is level eight? And it did make it out to the seven on the end, on the one end where the plumber is. Um, the guy that's engaged or was engaged at the time. Um, and then we have, so the so down that end, you have a little bit of an overhang. You can get down to floor seven. So if he was there, that would be different. Um, but he was on seven. The only debris I can get down on seven is through one of the openings in the floor or on, on eight going like the uh, elevator shaft or being out there where the other plumber was or is. And I don't, I don't see that at this time, and we can't get more details at this point. Although the contractor was not given any instructions to preload the backdrops, backdrops, uh, my eyes are done, and did not present any calculations making any assumptions above this, it was found in, pr in practice that the levels of preload measured in individual backdrops were high and were such that with one level of backpropping, the uppermost slab was not necessarily predicted to be the most critical loading. loading loaded. In the context of the 15th floor transfer slab, it would not have been possible to justify the construction of this slab using the new criteria unless the benefit effects of preload are taken into account. This again creates a problem since the temporary work design. The preload is meaning you, the dead load of the, the deck itself and they already added new weight to it already. Preloading it is what they're talking about. You're getting on it too soon with your next flooring. You know, you're already putting the, the props on it, and you're starting to stage your next floor. Um, that, that's the preload they're referencing. This, again, creates a problem since the temporary works designer would be faced with spec specifying a level of preload in the backdrops. Yeah, back props that the contractor would not be able to control or verify. In practice, such problems can be overcome. So he can't control or verify, meaning it's too soon, they're jumping on it. He can't um, determine the values because they didn't have the testing's not even ready yet. So you're getting up there one day later. Well, you know they're not te they're not breaking concrete one day later. You know that that that, that speed shouldn't even be out there. Um, but we have you know them doing it anyway. Um, so you would be testing the concrete before you're loading it with the next floor to say, okay, this is not preloading. This floor can take the loads that I'm going to pin uh, point loaded on with these columns. Um, quality control and site concerning the type, position, sequencing of placement and removal and tightening of back props is important and did not always appear to be exercised at St. George Wharf. So you see that, that this removal is critical. We talked about that and I alluded to that and talked about it a little bit in that one video. You just can't throw it up there. There's, uh, there's engineering that goes along with that, including testing of the, the concrete that you're loading, um, that you're putting the back props on. The supports at the time, uh, supports at the time, back props after the concrete's been poured. So I, I like this system here. I don't know if you've seen the flying up. Uh, which form is it? Oh, I lost it. Great. Um, it's a form work that you actually leave in place as your back props. Um, where is it? Um, usually means that uppermost slabs carries all the weight of the false work. Spreadsheet allows for loading of a specific. Um, I think I just lost it. My eyes are done. Like I said, they're. Uh, I got LASIKs. Don't ever get LASIKs, guys. My eyes. So I'm seeing kind of a blur, but I'm gonna finish this for you. Um, do 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 do. It was a system. I thought I just saw it where the where the uh, the uh, supports the, 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 the stay in place, and that is your back props. Where the heck is it? So I, I like this section here. It just makes it so much easier to, for you guys to be able to find it too and do your own reading and helps you understand it better, I would hope. But let me tell you a case study in, the, in this series of applying best practices. St. George Wharf Project Overview. Early age concrete strength assessment. All right. Early age construction loading. So really assessment, meaning testing. Not, not of that concrete, but samples. 
um, early age construction loading, now you're putting materials on top, etc. Reinforcement relations, rationalization and supply. Uh, slab deflections, you're going to be dealing with that. And special concretes, if, it, if at all. This was not a special concrete mix. So lo look at their formula here. W equals this is their, their construction load. WSER equals design service load. FC estimated concrete strength at time of application of construction load confirmed by measurement. Um, lock te that's uh, the test they use. FCU equals specified characteristics cube strength at 28 days. So they're doing the crush test. You know, they, they, what amounts to crushing the uh, their cubes. And they did say cubes, so a cube is typically two by two, two inch square. But I don't, I don't think they really meant cube there. I don't know. I can't tell the rest. Of this. this is nice, nice paper, but I can't get it. So this gives you your, your idea of what's going on when you these back props that we're talking about, and how critical they are that you don't remove them. Maybe this will give a lot of the uh, layman um, something to consider on how it, how it acts and reacts. And how important it is, the design matters, the location matters, clearly the size matters. So, you know, it, that buckling we see there, I've also, you know, alluded to, is that thing extended too far out? Is it, you know, are they pushing the, are they using the right um, dimensionally, dimensional, correct uh, back propping? Um, you know, maybe that buckling because it's a, you know, defective or wrongly placed member. Uh, moving on. But nevertheless, you're still getting deflection too much. It was doing, going to that capacity. So if you guys want to do any of your own research, you can look up back propping with the hyphen between it. And there's different papers and things like that. And you, I'm trying to find, believe it or not, the one failure. The only one failure I'm trying to find, I can't find it. I remember seeing a report on it, and it dealt with uh, this something like this. And they kept going on. They only did two floors instead of the three floors, and that caused a collapse in people's death. And heck if I can't find it now. Um, so you guys are pretty good. Who knows? You might find it before me. But that will show you the importance of uh, of back propping, why it's so, why it's so important. And especially allowing the, cure, the concrete to set to an ability that can hold the weight.